Good morning. My name is Heath Jackson. I'm the Community Groups Pastor at Outer Banks Community Church. We're delighted to have you joining in with us this morning. Today we're going to study uh, John 17, where Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. To do that this morning, we're going to start off singing a song called Jerusalem. This is a new song. We hope you like it. Silent as a lamb 
Well, good morning and thank you for joining today. Uh, as usual, I've recorded this ahead of time and I'm home together with my family watching this morning as you are. And today we're continuing in our message series, Becoming One. Through this, we're going beginning to end in John's gospel, looking at God's desire to bring unity among his people while exploring the dimensions of sin that still create separation from God and from one another in this life. And today we'll look at that in the context of unity. The unity of Jesus and the Father and the unity of believers in him. Now, some people feel like uh, everything has to be going really well for them to pray to God or that if things are bad, they can't talk to him. But this is just not the case. God wants us to talk to him all the time. And in fact, this is how we maintain unity with him. So as we prepare to look at that today, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, God, thank you for who you are. Thank you that you are three and you are one. Lord Jesus, thank you that you show us exactly who the Father is and that through you we receive the Holy Spirit who is exactly like you. God, I pray that as we come to your word this morning, we would come to know you better. We would come to understand what it means to have you living in us and we would come to understand better what it means to be guided by your word so that our lives uh, are conformed to it. Uh, I pray that we would have understanding this morning, and I pray that I would speak your word faithfully. And I ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right. <clears throat> 
This morning we're going to be in John chapter 17, and we'll be doing verses 1 through 26, which is the whole chapter. Now before we read, let's go over a little background information, uh, just to get up to speed for where we're coming into things today. Uh, as you've heard me say for several weeks, a major aspect of the gospel is that God has come to us by becoming one of us. In Jesus, God has become a fully human person while still remaining fully God. And in his life, death, and resurrection, Jesus has made it possible for us to be together with him and each other forever by responding to him in faith. Now, the Gospel of John was written by John, who was a disciple of Jesus, and it has three main themes that express this. The first is that Jesus is God. The second is that Jesus is the Messiah, or the Christ. And the third is that God has given us a choice. He's given us a choice to believe him or not. Now, John has written for the purpose that you may believe or you may have faith that Jesus is both God and Messiah, which is what he says in chapter 20, verse 31. These things are written that you may believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in him. Now, at this stage of John's gospel, we're in the last few hours before Jesus will give his life on the cross. And for over three years, he's been proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. He's been performing miracles, and he's been training his disciples. Uh, Jesus has been working closely with them to shape their understanding of God's word and their approach to life in this world based on it. In this last week, and specifically these last few hours, Jesus has been preparing his disciples for his coming death. As they've been walking uh, out from the place where they had dinner to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus has been talking with them. And as we join in now, he prays for them. Uh, so beginning in verse 1 of chapter 26, uh, it says, Jesus spoke these things, looked up to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you. For you gave him authority over all flesh, so he may give eternal life to all you have given him. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. I have glorified you on the earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with that glory I had with you before the world existed. I have revealed your name to the men you gave me from the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know all things you have given me are from you, because the words that you gave me I have given to them. They have received them and have known for certain that I came from you. They have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, because they are yours. Everything I have is yours, and everything you have is mine, and I have been glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by your name, that name you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I was protecting them by your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one was lost, except the son of destruction, so that the scripture may be fulfilled. Now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world, so that they may have my joy completed in them. I have given them your word. The world hated them, because they are not of the world, as I am not of the world. I am not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. I sanctify myself for them, so they also may be sanctified by the truth. I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their message. May they all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. May they also be one in us so the world may believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you have given me. May they be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they be made completely one, so the world may know you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire those you have given me to be with me where I am. Then they will see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the world's foundation. Righteous Father, the world has not known you. 
However, I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. I made your name known to them, and will make it known, so the love you have loved me with may be in them, and I may be in them. All right. <clears throat> so what have we just heard? All right. Jesus is praying uh, to the Father in heaven, and uh, he said a number of things. So uh, let's take a look at this a little more closely and kind of get our arms around uh, what's happening here. As I mentioned before we began reading, Jesus has been talking with his disciples. They had been walking from the place where they had dinner out to the Garden of Gethsemane. Very soon, Judas will arrive with the temple police. Jesus will be falsely arrested, illegally tried, and sentenced to execution. Where we joined in, they've arrived in the garden. Jesus knows what's coming, and he prays. He prays for himself in verses 1 through 5. He prays for his disciples in verses 6 through 19. And he prays for all who will come to believe through their message in verses 20 through 26. Starting out in verse 1, Jesus prays for himself, and what he asks for is not actually for him, but for the Father. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so the Son may glorify you. In other words, Father, through me, glorify yourself. Jesus goes on, You've given me authority over all flesh, or all people, so I can give eternal life to all those you've given me. And then Jesus defines eternal life. He says eternal life is to know the Father as the only true God and to know Jesus as the one he sent. The one who, as Jesus goes on to say in verse 4, has completed the work he was given to do. So Jesus asks in verse 5 to be returned to the glory he had with the Father from before the world existed. And as Jesus points out in verse 6, the work he's completed is the work of revealing the Father. I have revealed your name. In other words, I revealed you to the men you gave me from the world. Which brings us right to the main point of what's being said here, and it's this. <clears throat> Eternal life is knowing God in Jesus. Eternal life is knowing God in Jesus. Knowing God as the one true God. Knowing Jesus as the one who reveals him. And knowing Jesus has completed the work he's been sent to do. Eternal life comes through knowing God as he's revealed himself in Jesus and trusting that Jesus has completed everything he came to do. You see, God has revealed himself through his word. Jesus is the word made flesh, as John told us back in chapter 1, verse 14. And God has promised his word will never return void, Isaiah 55, 11. In other words, God's word will never come back to him without accomplishing the purpose of for which he sent it out. Jesus, as the Word made flesh, is the human embodiment of everything that comes from the Father. Everything that is the Father's has been given to the Son, and everything that has been given to the Son is given to God's people by his Spirit. This is what Jesus has told his disciples in John 16, verses 14 through 15. The Spirit of truth will glorify me, because he will take from what is mine and make it known to you. Everything the Father has is mine. This is why I told you the Spirit takes from what is mine and will make it known to you. This makes sense when you understand God reveals himself as three persons who are one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They've always existed together. They do everything together. And while they're distinct, having different roles uh, in the work that they're doing, they share equally in everything it means to be God. You know, a major aspect of their unity is having the same purpose, the same goal, uh, and each doing their part together in it. God's purpose is to make himself known through his people. This is why Adam and Eve were made to begin with, and it's why God told Abraham, through your descendants, all people of the earth will be blessed. You know, through their mutual involvement and commitment to their common person, purpose, I'm sorry, each person of God fully represents the other. Uh, making them known and bringing glory uh, to one another rather than to themselves. You see, Jesus emphasizes this here when he says in verse 1, Father, glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you. What brings glory to the others is continued commitment to their common purpose. 
So their purpose is achieved and their unity is unbroken. And this is one of the reasons that God is one God. Though he is three, he's also one. Uh, which Jesus talks about in verse 4 when he says, I have glorified you on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Jesus has done nothing but make the Father known. It's been the Spirit who makes Jesus known, and all of this is for the purpose of God's people knowing his salvation so they can come into eternal life by trusting his word and also taking his word to others so others can come to him as well. So the major point here is this. Jesus has accomplished the purpose for which he was sent. Jesus has accomplished the purpose for which he was sent. He's completed the work he's been given to do. And this brings us to three points I want to make and then discuss. Uh, and, it's, and it's this. The work of Jesus is threefold. It's to represent God, it's to forgive sin, and it's to make disciples. To represent God, to forgive sin, and to make disciples. The better you know the master, the better you can do his work. So let's look at these beginning with the first. All right, the work of Jesus is to represent the Father. The job of the Son is to honor the Father, to represent him completely. This is how Jesus makes the Father known. He's completely obedient to him. He does nothing other than what he sees the Father doing. He doesn't speak a word other than what he hears from the Father. And he's always doing the Father's work with him. This is why uh, uh, Jesus says in, in John 6, My Father is working and I'm always working too. In this way, to see Jesus is to see the Father because it's like looking in a mirror. Second, the work of Jesus is to forgive sin. Right? The work of Jesus is to forgive sin. Jesus refers to himself as the Christ or the Messiah. Those two words mean the same thing in verse 3. This is his specially assigned role as the Redeemer of humanity. In the work of salvation, Jesus is the one who has no sin, but takes the punishment for sin upon himself. In representing the Father, it's not only doing what he does and saying what he says, but it's having the same character and desires as well. God's character is justice and mercy. His character is holiness and love. Because God is holy, sin cannot go unpunished. Because God is just, wrong must be righted. Because God is merciful and loving, he must do it himself. To do it himself, he has to become one of his people so he can do it on their behalf. God is the maker of all life. He's the redeemer of it as well, and he's redeemed human life by living it. This is why Jesus has been given authority over all flesh or all people, verse 2, because he's not only made each of us, he's also given his life for each of us. And third, Jesus' work is to train disciples. Jesus' work is to train disciples, to teach people how to do what he does for the reasons that he does it so their lives come to represent his. Jesus has been training his disciples to understand and obey God's word and to do his work in the world, which was the design from the beginning, right? If you go back to Genesis 1.27, we see all people are made in God's image, male and female, he made them in his own image. In other words, people have been designed to represent God here on earth. And a primary aspect of that is sharing his purpose and working his plan. This happens through a commitment to God such that your life is being changed by his word, so that your attitude, your perspectives, your purpose in all things grows to be the same as God's. So your life becomes more and more like the life of Jesus. This is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, and it's no surprise the next time Jesus reminds his disciples that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, is when Jesus is returning to the Father in heaven after his resurrection, and he's telling his disciples to continue in the purpose and the plan. And he says to them, Go therefore and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 19-20. This brings glory to God because what's happening 
when you're making disciples of Jesus, what's happening is you're not trying to represent yourself, but him. This is why in John 15, when Jesus urged his disciples to remain in him, to remain connected to him and doing his work, he said in John 15, 8, My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. The purpose of a disciple's life is to bring others to Jesus and to help them grow in their relationship with God, as well as their relationship with others. This is being a witness to Jesus by taking up your part in his work, taking up your part in his mission. So a key understanding for believers is this. The work of Jesus' disciples is done on earth. It's done on earth, not in heaven. This is exactly why Jesus doesn't want them taken from this world, and that's why he turns next to pray for them. He does this in verses 6 through 19, so let's take a look at that now by asking this. How does Jesus pray for his disciples? How does Jesus pray for his disciples? Well, he prays specifically for them in three ways. He prays first for their protection. He prays second for their unity. And he prays third for their sanctification. What all this comes down to is he's praying for their perseverance and their reliance on God in the work that he's given them to do. You see, the disciples have a job to do. They've been chosen out of the world for it, and Jesus is praying they'll continue in it. Again, all of this is what Jesus prays for in verses 6 through 19, so I'd like to review that and draw your attention to a few things. Jesus begins in verses 6 through 8 with certain affirmations or certain statements. He says he's revealed the Father's name to those he's given him, that they were the fathers, that the Father gave them to Jesus, and that these men have kept God's word, the same word that the Father has given to Jesus. So something to note here is Jesus isn't taking credit for anything. In fact, he's giving all the credit to his Father. Jesus goes on to say his disciples know that everything Jesus has is from the Father, and this is because the words or the message that Jesus has has given them is the same message that the Father gave him. The disciples have believed it, and so they've believed in Jesus. In other words, their faith is certain. So after this, Jesus goes on to pray for them, saying in verses 9 through 19, I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, because they are yours. Everything I have is yours, and everything you have is mine, and I have been glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, but they are. I am coming to you. Protect them by your holy name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as you and I are one. You know, something to point out here is the Father and Son are in continual fellowship through the Holy Spirit. This is the same kind of unity that he's praying for among his disciples. Uh, And then Jesus goes on in verse 12, While I was with them, I protected them. I guarded them, and not one was lost except for the son of destruction or the son of perdition, so the scripture may be fulfilled. Now, let me pause here and let's take a look at a few things. The son of destruction or perdition is Judas Iscariot. He betrayed Jesus, not that he was destined to, but that he chose to. When Jesus talks about the world, it means both the unbelieving world and the whole creation, and that depends on the context in which it's used. The unbelieving world, uh, as we find, is opposed to God. It rejects his word, it rejects him, and it rejects those who live by his word and represent him. But it's actually for the world that Jesus has given his life. This is how God has loved the world, John 3.16. He sent his one and only Son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So I want to point out a contrast that Jesus is making in verse 9. He's praying for his disciples, not for the world. The reason, verse 8, is because they believe and the world doesn't. Because of their belief, that means they'll take up their part in God's work, but the world won't. And the point is this, God has made the world and God loves the world, 
but not everyone in the world will love him. As I mentioned earlier, all people are made by God, but not all people will choose to represent him. To represent God means joining into his work and being a person of his word. Jesus' disciples have made this crucial shift, which is why Jesus says in verse 11, I have been glorified in them. Not that they've done a whole lot yet, but they've committed to representing him, and this glorifies Jesus. Now, something I want to step out to the side and talk about here for a moment in light of recent events is this. Jesus' followers are to represent him by working for heavenly realities here in our time. The work of Jesus is to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth, both knowing that it won't come in its fullness until his return, but that it's no excuse to allow injustice now. You see, for quite some time in our country, racial oppression has existed. People are currently crying out to be heard. Unfortunately, many of their cries are being met with apathy. They're being shrugged off or they're being obscured by opportunistic uh, looting that all too many people want to just chalk up to the actual peaceful protesters. And what this all goes back to is the basic biblical truth that all people are made in God's image. For this reason, every life is of equal value, regardless of race, regardless of national identity, regardless of social standing, regardless, regardless of economic level, or any other worldly measure that you might use. I have unfortunately heard the cry, Black Lives Matter, met with the response, well, all lives matter. And true as this may be, it's unfortunately often a dismissal of the real issue. You see, when people say black lives matter, they're not saying black lives matter more than any other life. What they're saying is black lives matter as much. They matter as much as anyone else's life, but the reason that they have to say it is because black lives aren't being treated that way. Where injustice and inequity among people is happening, it's the responsibility of God's people to work for justice now. It is, in fact, our duty to do it ourselves, in our own communities, in our own relationships, not sweeping things under the rug or turning a blind eye, but recognizing those who have been disadvantaged and taking action to help. In the body of Christ, as 1 Corinthians 12 tells us, those parts of the body thought to be less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. That's verse 23. And the whole idea that's being conveyed there is those parts of the body who think that the other part of the body is less honorable, well, those parts of the body need to humble themselves and they need to give more glory and more honor to those that they think are less honorable. When it comes to those who have actually been uh, disadvantaged, when it comes to those who have been oppressed, when it comes to those who have been uh, uh, left out uh, in the cold, so to speak, then something has to be done to make that right. It's for this reason Jesus has, in verse 19, sanctified himself so that his disciples may also be sanctified. He has given himself fully to God's purpose. He has given his own life as a sacrifice so that his disciples may receive his glory, which they are in turn to give to others. It's difficult in this world to always see clearly to avoid the schemes and deceptions of the evil one, which is why Jesus prays for his disciples' protection, that they will be sanctified by the word of truth so they can live and do as Jesus does. And it brings us to the major point being made here, which is this. Faith brings immediate and ongoing change. Faith brings immediate and ongoing change. It brings an immediate positional change to Jesus' righteousness and an ongoing transformation to his likeness. Faith in Jesus places you immediately and permanently in his hand through his own sacrifice, not yours. As you embrace the work of God by uh, the work of his word and his spirit to sanctify you, the more you'll grow to represent Jesus in this world. Jesus says of his disciples in verse 14, they're not of the world as I'm not of the world. In other words, an immediate positional change has taken place. However, he prays for them. He prays for their protection. He prays for their sanctification because there are changes that still need to take place even though the future reality 
is already achieved. And in verse 12, he says, I've not lost one of one you've given me except for the one doomed to destruction. And he's talking about Judas. Judas had not made the change from being of the world. Jesus told his disciples in John 15, you're clean because of the word I've spoken to you. If you'll recall, Judas was not there with them. But in the upper room, when Judas was there, Jesus said, not all of you are clean. Faith in Jesus places you in his hand and you can't be taken from it. Working with God is an ongoing process of living by the truth, and the truth is his word. This creates ongoing change so that you will do your part in his work now. The more this happens, the more the enemy is going to oppose you. His major goal is the defacement of God's image in people. He does this through lies and distortions of the truth, all aimed at taking believers out of God's work, which is most effective when he can get you to divide from your co-workers, from your brothers and sisters. You know, I've heard it said that the enemy has two goals. The first is to keep people out of the kingdom, and the second is to render them useless in it. Being the church involves learning, discerning, and doing together, which is what Paul describes in Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, when he says, Jesus personally gave some to be apostles, some prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the training of the saints in the work of the ministry, to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and knowledge of God's Son, growing to maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. And then he goes on to say, in this way, we'll no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness and the techniques of deceit. Something to be aware of is this. Even the work of the enemy accomplishes God's purpose, and we see that with Judas. But who you work with is whose will you're doing. And even those who feel close to Jesus can be deceived. All right. <clears throat> well, following this, Jesus prays for all believers, and he does this in verses 20 through 26. So let's take a look at that now by asking this question. How does Jesus pray for all believers? Right? How does he pray for all believers? Well, in a nutshell, he prays for their unity and their witness that through their witness, the world would see God. The world would know that Jesus had been sent from God. And their witness would be a result of their unity with him and with each other. Now, what's important to understand about this is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have always been unified. It's not something they go in and out of. Uh, and that's the same thing that Jesus is praying for his believers, not only that they would become unified, but they would continually remain unified. Now, again, this is what Jesus prays for in verses 20 through 26, and I'd like to draw your attention to a few things here. Jesus starts out praying not only for his disciples, but for all who will believe through their message. So when he says, may they all be one, as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, Jesus is talking about everyone who will come to faith in every successive generation of believers. So he's talking here about the universal church. When he says, may they also be one in us, verse 21, so the world may believe that you sent me, he's talking about a continual unity just like within the Trinity. This unity is expressed not only in living within each other, but working together in the same purpose. Jesus states this again in verses 22 through 23, making the point that the unity of believers is for the purpose of the world knowing Jesus. This, the way this happens is God's people are working together in his common purpose, and that brings up the question of unity and diversity then within the body of believers, right, within the church. Now, the church is both universal and local. Uh, in the universal sense, this is all believers across all time who are joined together in a special way through Christ. In the local sense, we're talking about specific groups of believers in specific places at specific times. 
Uh, so how should we understand then different groups of believers, right? Uh, different churches or congregations, different denominations existing in the same place at the same time. Uh, should everyone just be one giant church or are all these divisions somehow okay? Well, the unity Jesus is talking about is the same unity of purpose that exists within the persons of God. Just as Father, Son, and Spirit do everything together, have the same goal and purpose, and never break from one another in fellowship, Jesus is praying the same for his people. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul affirms both the individuality of the parts or the members of the church and their unity of purpose by saying this, for as the body is one and has many parts, and all the parts of that body, though many, it is one body, so also is Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. So the body is not one part, but many. Now he goes on to say that each part has a distinct function, but all parts work together under the direction of the head, who is Jesus Christ, and that the body would not work effectively if all the parts were the same. And God has arranged each and every part of the body exactly the way he wants it to be. Now, the point of all, all that is this. Diversity is God's design for his people. Diversity is God's design for his people. Each congregation and each individual has a uniqueness, but we also have a sameness, and we're supposed to be working together, not apart. So there's no problem with different churches, with different congregations, with different denominations. The problem is when we forget the fact that we're all joined together in the common cause of Christ. Um, there's a sameness of purpose that God intends and it grows to take hold when we, as his people, realize his presence within us. In verses 24 through 26, Jesus talks more about this and how it will be accomplished. Father, he says, I desire those you have given me to be with me where I am. Now, let me point out, Jesus has been very clear. He's going back to the Father, that he doesn't want the disciples taken out of the world. So what does he mean asking for his disciples to be with him where he is? If he's going back to the Father in heaven, then how is that going to happen? Let me point out here, there are two future times being talked about. There are two futures in view for Jesus. His ultimate return to the earth and the sending of the Holy Spirit, which is going to come after his resurrection. And this goes back to what Jesus has already said in John 14. In my Father's house there are many rooms, or many dwelling places. I go away to prepare a place for you, and if I do this, surely I'll come back to receive you to myself, so that where I am, you can be also. Then Jesus goes on to say, In a little while the world will see me no longer, but you will see me, because I live, you will live too, and in that day... You will know I am in my Father, you are in me, and I am in you. When Jesus' disciples come to understand they are the dwelling place of God, that by the Holy Spirit the Father and Son live in them, this will affect how they view and use their lives. Which is the point Paul makes in 1 Corinthians 3.16 when he says to those believers, Don't you know you are God's sanctuary? and that the Spirit of God lives in you. The way this will happen is what Jesus also talks about in verse 24 when he says, I desire, I desire that they would be where I am. I desire is the same word there for will, as in last will and testament. In other words, I make a will, I make a death decree that this should happen, which is how it's used in Hebrews 10 to talk about uh, how God has brought us into the inheritance that he has promised in his will, as in last will and testament, which is through the death of the one who made it, and that's Jesus Christ. And the whole point here is this. Jesus is going to his death in order to give his people 
his spirit so that now and forever he can be in us and we can be in him. He can be where we are and we can be where he is. And the place he's talking about is inside of you, which brings us right to the heart of the word, and it's this. Jesus gives his life for unity. Jesus gives his life for unity. And through Jesus, we have unity with those who are in him if we will choose him. You see, the goal of Jesus' actions are unity with the Father and unity with us. And it's the choice for Jesus that brings us into unity with him and unity with one another. This is a unity obtained through the body and blood of Jesus. And though everything necessary has been accomplished, it's one we won't fully realize until Jesus' return. The reason for that is because of our own sin. And that sin is the sin of choosing for our own will instead of God's. When I choose for my own will, I'm choosing to represent myself. Billions of people choosing for themselves will never be unified. But even just two choosing for God's will, will. And it's no surprise that prayer is where Jesus begins for seeking not only his unity with the Father, but ours. I don't want us to overlook the fact that all through this, Jesus has been praying. And prayer is important because prayer is what places your will in line with God's will. It's also no surprise the other prayers of Jesus recorded in the garden were for just that. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. However, not my will, but yours be done. You see, prayer is the primary action of unity with God. It's the primary action of unity with God. In prayer, you recognize him, you recognize his presence, you recognize his authority, and you recognize the need to place your will under his. Is it any surprise that when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he taught them to pray for God's will to be done on earth just as it is in heaven. See, prayer is entering communion with God and actually communion with him through communication. A communion Jesus has accomplished on our behalf by becoming fully one of us while remaining fully God and making a communion of heaven and earth. But Jesus has always been in constant communication with the Father, right? And this is one, this is, this is a communion that we participate in when we pray. One that Jesus prays will be constant or continual for those who believe, which is no doubt why Paul also says, pray without ceasing. In other words, remain in constant communication with God, not necessarily pouring out words over and over and over and over, but keep God in your thought, keep, keep, keep God in, 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 your, in your dialogue, uh, keep, his, keep his purposes involved in everything in your life. Be in constant awareness of God's presence and be talking with him. While Jesus did ultimately go to the cross, ahead of it, he says, I have completed the work you gave me to do. Let me suggest to you that Jesus' victory was won in prayer long before the time of action ever came. Because in prayer, Jesus' life was already fully given to God. So the question I'd like to ask and leave you with is this. Can you say the same? Can you say that your will is surrendered to God in prayer? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, God, thank you that you are in constant communion and communication within yourself. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that by your life, death, and resurrection, uh, by your hand in creating us and your hand in redeeming us, through the giving of your Spirit and the giving of your Word, God, you have made it possible for us to be in communication with you, to be in communion with you. And I pray, Lord, that uh, we would understand what that means for our own lives when it comes to doing your will or doing our own. I pray that we would understand how 
simply recognizing your presence and coming to you in prayer is the first action of faith. It's the first action of trust and obedience, and it is what ultimately brings us in line with you. I pray that we would be more of a praying people, and I ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. That's what we have for today, and uh, as we draw our time together to a close, there are two things I'd like to mention. First, if you'd like to speak to someone about anything that you've heard in the message today, or if you're interested in knowing more about the church and potentially working with someone here, uh, you can reach out to us by emailing info at obxcc.org, leaving a comment here on the page, or you can go to our website, which is obxcc.org, and there's a contact form there. Uh, we'll be happy to connect with you, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.